You are listening to the Game Like Training podcast, where we talk about golf practice, golf learning, and golf psychology. On this show, we're going to be sharing our thoughts and our beliefs that have come from over a decade of being in the industry. Not only that, but we'll be talking to industry leaders, world-renowned academics, and pioneering professors to bring you the most up-to-date information and evidence-based strategies to help you improve your game or your golf coaching. Hi, I'm one of your hosts, Eric Zeigel. And I'm your co-host, Ian Highfield. And before we get started, I just want to say we love golf and we love helping people. That combined has driven us to create this podcast. There's so much good information out there. We believe it's our responsibility to share that information with as many people as we can. So on today's show, we have expert in learning and golf coach, Graham McDowell. Graham, how are you, buddy? Yeah, I'm good, Ian. Thanks. Awesome. Um, Graham, for the listeners, obviously myself, Eric, and, and a, lo- a, f- a lot of coaches in the industry know mm. who you are from, from your phenomenal work within constraints-led learning and, and golf. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a few listeners that, that don't know as much about you. They potentially might think that you won the US Open a few years back. Right? <laughs> um, so we need, to, we need to tidy that one up. Um, if you just introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about your latest venture for us, that'd be awesome. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Eric, for the introduction. Um, I'm a PGA of Great Britain qualified golf professional, first and foremost. Um, in terms of my background, that's um, how I started in the industry. And then I moved into further in higher education. So my uh, full-time employment is in uh, f- higher education at the moment, um, helping young people develop a career in the golf industry. Many of those go on to be professionals themselves and to be uh, co- uh, golf coaches. My, late- my latest venture is with a chap you, you may know called Peter Arnett. It's called Golf Otech. Uh, golf Otech is a community-based project that... Um, is coach education based. OTEC stands for on the edge of chaos as a metaphor for learning. Um, and then the constraints led approach and borrowed from dynamic systems theory, I guess, is the, the idea that uh, learning takes place on the journey back from chaos towards some sort of order. Um, and as such, we're trying to look at some of the tools that coaches can use to um, place their players into that, that phase of development. Um, that allows them to um, transition to a, a higher level of performance. That's the that's the basic idea. The the, the OTEC thing is bigger than that. There's a, a community behind it. There's various different courses, guest lectures, or guest present presentations from various experts uh, across the constraints led approach, but into other other approaches as well. So that's the basic outline of it, guys. Awesome. So Graham, let me ask. What, what inspired you to, you know, you're, you're a PGA professional um, golf coach. Um, what inspired you to take this journey into research and then create OTEC? I, th- I think the, uh, the, the honest answer to that is I was inspired to get out of uh, working in a retail environment in the, in the pro shop. <laughs> I went, I, uh, Very honest, met, same. <laughs> uh, and that's the honest answer. I remember speaking to one of my, I mean, I'm based in Scotland and uh, uh, I was speaking to one of my early mentors about that. And he said, you know, why would you want to open a shop in the middle of a field where it rains all the time? <laughs> I mean, that's a really good point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I was kind of at that stage. I was thinking about where I was going with things. Um, and I ended up signing up at the University of Birmingham. You know, I've done an amazing, amazing job in terms of um, upscaling the, um, the education and evidence base of uh, the, uh, the PGA professional, and I got involved in that at the very early stages, and it's been it's been going on since then. And we kind of found the uh, kind of gravitating towards the sort of ecological dynamics, constraints led type of theory because it just kind of made sense to me. It made sense to my own development as a player. It made sense to so many of the conversations conversations I've had with very good players over the years and I could locate their stories within that framework more so than I could locate their stories within uh, the approach that I was taking which was the kind of champions model of the time which would be a faldo uh, approach of remodeling your swing and hitting thousands of balls you know and um, I would have the sort of calcuses on my hand to prove that I, I, I was taking that approach but uh, wasn't very successful at um, transferring that to, to the golf course, although I was a very, very good striker of the golf ball. Um, 
you know, and it just caused that sort of critical reflection about the stories of um, um, you know, the very good players of the day in Scotland because golf's such a natural resource to us. We're surrounded by really good players and um, and, and, and their stories, as, as, as I'm suggesting, I, I could... Um, I, I could find um, support for their stories within this this framework more than I could within the approach that I was taking. So, long-winded answer that I think, guys. But that's the kind of flavour of it. It's perfect, you know. And, and you use the term critical reflection. Um, I think that's huge. Um, that's one of the reasons that I see some players improve because they're very good at, at, at critical reflection. And obviously yourself. You, you had some form of motivation to move away from what you were doing yeah. uh, and then used critical reflection to be, okay, you know, this is, this is what I went through. I guess now the goal is, is helping others not necessarily go through that traditional repetition is king, beat golf balls till your hands lead. What, yes. What is this new model then? What does it look like? Because some of our listeners might not no constraints-led learning or dynamical systems theory. So if you can explain uh, on yeah. a more practical yeah, basis what it, what it would be. Can I, I'm just going to backtrack on one little point, actually, course, uh, Ian, yeah. for a second, is to say that uh, not to decry the professional route of working in, in a traditional pro shop uh, environment, I need to say that I, I became aware pretty early on that I was rubbish at it. Um, <laughs> so it's not to say that a good... Uh, and, and one of my last bosses in that, uh, field uh, used to call myself and the other assistant the sales prevention team. We were that bad at um, uh, that's that bad for like training. That's what they call me, sales prevention officer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we were the sales prevention team. So I, uh, it was more that I was rubbish at it than uh, it wasn't a legitimate career path. I must say so. Um, but moving on, your your question was around the sort of what what is the ecological approach, if you like, or what is the um, constraints led approach and kind of all, in, all encompassing to an extent it's, it's trying to acknowledge that um, but potentially we learn best when we're in in the natural environment of the performance context rather than divorced from that so if you think about heading to the practice ground to put down a bag of balls and hit thousands of shots um, there's a whole lot of information that you're divorced from there um, that you would that you would use on the golf course and, and not only use on the golf course, but be affected by on the golf course. So your lie, your lie on the golf course is going to affect your angle of attack. And um, if the ball's sitting down a little bit and it's that information um, that is, if you like, con controlling your movement and, uh, and dynamical systems theory or the, um, the in general, you've got what, what you call the uh, control parameter and the order parameter and, um, the, the the order parameter, if you like, is the coordination, the dynamics of your um, body and how you're coordinating the various limbs and segments and joints. Uh, the control parameter parameter is well, what what is actually forcing that organization, and what's for forcing that organization is information and information and that information's in the environment. Um, and um, so, if you're going to learn, the potentially the best way to learn is with all that information. Present and flowing. Don't uh, don't don't get rid of all that information because it's that information that's telling you how to move and what moves appropriate, and uh, uh, and, and it provides some uh, like action fidelity. It's um, it's authentic movement in your environment, and you very often get the um, you hear various stories. A very good one that I heard recently was Peter Beardsley, the ex Liverpool football player, when he was asked to. He was asked to demonstrate his trademark mark move in front of a bunch of kids in a static environment, and he couldn't do it. He just simply couldn't do it um, because he was divorced from the information that brought the action on. What was that move, Greg? Is that like a drag back? Like when he... Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I would need to go and study that myself, but he just couldn't do it. Um, and he, and he, needed the, um, he needed the information, he needed the context um, for that movement to emerge. And, uh, and, that, and that, that would be a good example of that. So you're, you're really trying to um, keep as much of the information present and flowing that you would experience on the, the golf course. And there's lots of different information. Um, 
and there's also information that's uh, implied information, you know, what's implied by uh, not making a part at this hole, um, and, and, and how does that change my movement dynamics? Um, I always remember back in those early days, because you've got me thinking about those days, is that I, I used to have a, a two golf swings. I'd have a tournament swing, and I'd have a what I'd consider to be my golf swing. And my tournament swing would be this sort of horrible necky fade type thing that I just knew I could get around the golf course. And my real golf swing I always thought was the thing I was using when I was out playing with my mates, which was this nice kind of loose, free-flown thing. Uh, and that also dawned on me later on is that I'd been better trying to play with my tournament swing all the time and, and get better with my tournament swing when I was playing with my mates. Um, but, but in my tournament, my, my tournament swing emerged out of fear, I guess, of of just needing to fashion something that could get me around this golf course in a decent number. Yeah. Um, and it's just that element of how information changes behavior. And uh, you know, I was just talking earlier to Pete, actually, as we're putting some stuff together. And you know, everybody essentially uses a constraints approach at one level or another because everything is a constraint on behavior. Um, so even if you're using direct instruction, that's still a constraint on the individual, the movements, the movement of that individual and the psychology of that individual that will have an effect on them. And it's just trying to get a deeper understanding of how how we use information and, and how it affects the system at a, a system-wide level. Awesome. And I, I, I've been fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with um, David Colclough when I've gone back to the... the back to England yeah. and visited the Belfry. I have a good friend there, Phil Akers, who's one of the teaching professionals there. Um, so I, I met with David and I know that the, the GB and I PGA are going a bit more down this route, which is, I think, great for golf. If you look at the lineup from the PGA show in Orlando this year and last year, the people that are speaking at these events are now talking more and more about this stuff, less about the golf swing, more about this stuff. So uh, there's, there's validity to this, a hundred percent. It's in line with mine and Eric's and Matthew's and game like training's belief, um, and this is the way the industry is shifting. So it's very exciting. So if I'm a golf coach listening to this, and this is resonating with me, where do I find your program? Where, what social media platforms do I go on? How do I engage with this phenomenal education that that yourself and P are, are putting out there? Well, that's a good, good question. I, mean, I, I did say I was the worst salesman ever, and I'm frankly trying to think of website addresses. <laughs> I think I just pitched it for you. Just give. I just tried to pitch it for you. You give the information. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the website is golfotech.com, which is just as it sounds, really, golf and otec.com, and that's where you'll get a bit of the background to what's going on there. Um, also, uh, Twitter at Grill McDowell, which is... Um, which is kind of Graham, G-R-A-E-M-E, M-C-D-O-W-A-L-L. Um, and that's kind of my two main kind of places that you'll that you'll, you'll find me. with a lot of attention going into the OTEC stuff at the moment. So I've been quite quiet around the social media. But um, yeah, that would be that'd be the easiest places to get me. And then what if I go onto the website and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm gonna part with my hard-earned cash. Um yeah. And then I'm going to enter this online community. What can I expect to What can I expect to find, and how will that help me become a better coach? Okay, so the the, the starting point is the, the 12 week course, which is um, split into kind of six weeks thinking about the theory, and uh, six weeks actually looking at some game design. So it starts a little bit theoretical, um, moving into the more practical side of things. But in between every theoretical presentation there's a live webinar okay uh, the live webinar relates to the presentation that you'll have heard the week before and also the discussion questions that we've, that we've posed uh, we encourage people to post those discussion questions up on the discussion boards uh, and then we will we will deal with them on, on the webinar so hopefully by the time that you you get to the sort of six seven week period you've got a fairly good idea of um how you go about designing games and that kind of thing. And really, for us, it's this idea of providing you with a, a base of support for what you're doing. So you're able to rationalize the uh, design of your training interventions uh, around some theoretical principles that have some evidence behind them 
the, the, themselves. So that would be the the twelve week course. There's um, other presentations on there. For instance, um, Gordon Morrison talking about his research into the yips and uh, what what type of um, interventions. How can you? How, we we talk about that in relation to the edge of chaos. Is that if you've got the yips, uh, you have you, your short game has descended into chaos. Um, at that point, you've gone beyond the edge of chaos, and, uh, and and Gordon's looking at what what can be retrieved from there, um, and his PhD research. So he's going to present on that, plus do a live webinar. Um, we've got Steve Astell, who's going to talk about the business model. You know, because one of the one of the biggest aspects about constraints led approach that we always get asked is, you know, how how, how does this fit into my business model? Yeah. You know, because we've evolved into this kind of one-to-one, -one, these one-to-one -one lessons, which is a historical thing based on time and available space. Um, and maybe not always, the, the developmental and the um, commercial haven't always necessarily meshed together really well. So Steve asked, still is going to be talking about that. And uh, Harjeev Singh is going to be talking about the language of of coaching and uh, what's contained in the and the message and the way you put it over. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. And the ethos is very much as the as the community as the community grows, we, we just put more back into the community. Um, uh, for somebody will come in, they pay a subscription, they get a year's access to the back end of the website. Um, so it's not just the course, it's the discussion boards, it's the academic library, it's the other presentations. And it's going to be pretty emergent as well. So if people from the community say, well, look, we'd really like to hear about this or this, then, you know, our ethos is to go out and, and uh, find the experts who will talk about it. Awesome. Uh, Graham. what is the, and I wouldn't, I, I don't like the word necessarily cost. I would say like more investment. Like what's, because this, yeah. this isn't, you're not, you're not, a cost is almost, okay, the money's gone. For me, this is an investment. So what's, what's the investment to, to subscribe for a year? Yep, so the first year is £299. Okay. British, British pounds, um, which gives you access to the 12 week constraint, gives you access to everything that's um, at the, 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 behind the paywall on the website. Um, thereafter, it's um, £99 a year once you've done the initial course. It's £99 to stay part of the community and, um, and access the resources that are back there access to discussion boards, access to the experts, um, and access any future content. So that's the that's the level of investment. Excellent. Um, and look, I, I know how hard yourself and, and Pete work, and I know sometimes, well, for me personally, it can be very tough going through some of these academic papers and firstly yeah. trying to actually read them, <laughs> in my case, and then actually yeah. taking that time to join the dots with, okay, this is the academic paper, now there's the end user. How am I going to take this to there? So for, for that investment, I, I know there's a phenomenal value for money there. Um, I'm probably Eric's wanting. Eric's probably going to ask me if he can sign up to it as soon as we finish the uh, the podcast. Yeah, no, I already. I think I already sent an email. <laughs> well, I've been sitting here. I just sent an email saying this, I need to do this. <laughs> so, Eric, do you have any more? Do you have questions, you know? based around some of the content that could be found in there you know yeah no i think this is something that i've spent a lot of time reading and um on my own and obviously learning from um conversations with ian matthew and then um stuart morgan i don't know if i think do you know Stu? yeah so i talked a lot about this with stuart um when i worked for him um at the international junior golf academy in in uh, bluffton south carolina so this is something that I really kind of dove into about two years ago, and it's really so interesting. The constraint-led learning stuff is something that I really um, enjoy, uh, not only reading, but obviously applying into my, my teaching and coaching. Um, but I, I'm just curious, can you kind of give the listeners an example as far as kind of how this dynamic systems theory approach and the constraint-led learning approach, how this how you adjust this. I don't, I'm not entirely sure what skill level you typically work with, but from, you know, you, you have a new golfer to uh, somebody that you might say is an expert, we'll say, um, or, or at a high standard, how that kind of changes based on that skill level. 
Yeah, definitely. Good, good question. And what, what you have is principally the, uh, the, the same approach. But if you're working with a new golfer, the new golfer's got plenty of chaos in their system. As it is, you don't really need to inject anymore. Uh, but right. as a player gets better and better and better and they, and they um, experience more and more stability, um, what, you, what can you do to help them get to the, um, the next level and break them out of that potential automaticity of um, a kind of performance plateau where I've, you know, I've reached this level of performance and things aren't getting any better? Well, the, the, the principles of a dynamic system theory is really about um, the principles of self-organization around instability and uh, how the how the system's pre-designed to try and retain a sense of stability that um, you know we're all perfectly functioning organisms in the world for the demands that we've placed on ourselves um, you know so I spend a lot of time sitting down so I'm a little bit overweight uh, but but I don't really need to be uh, I don't need to be physically physiologically adapted to do anything more strenuous than that at times um, so but if you're a level, if you're a mini tour player and you're trying to get to the next level of performance, what you don't want to be is a, yeah, I'm a kind of, I'm a pretty comfortable tour level, uh, mini tour level player. So a dynamical systems theory would give you the principles of, um, you know, what are we going to do to destabilize the system so it grows back stronger? Okay, so, you know, there's, there's physiological examples or there's psychological examples. You know, a, a distance runner uh, will experience an enlarged heart out of the demands of training and the need to pump more oxygen around their body. Um, so that would be a physical adaptation to training stress. Um, and um, our bone density in a tennis player, if you look at you know, Rafael Nadal's right arm is much bigger than his left arm, which is a, a physiological adaptation to the stress of his practice. So, so within an ecological dynamics framework, you have the ecological psychology, which is trying to um, understand the use of information and, and perception and action around how we perceive the world. Dynamical systems theory gives you the, the kind of growth part of that. The, how are we going to use some of these principles to um, uh, stimulate development and what stimulates development and the edge of chaos is that, that place where the journey back to stability is the learning process. But it's non-linear because the journey back can be satisfied in many different ways. So you, 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 rather than the coach trying to preempt and take the player by their hand to a sort of orderly position, uh, there's an element of the player having to figure out and problem solve what do I need to do in order to um, uh, in order to to satisfy the the stress that I'm under. So that's. Uh, kind of idea. And as I was saying, you know, a beginner doesn't really need that. The beginner just needs a bit of probably a bit of initial stability. They've got enough chaos there anyway. Um, so if you can come up with some concepts and ideas just to get them striking a ball better, then that's that's good information to give to a uh, to a beginner to a beginner player. So it applies Great. right across the spectrum though. There's a um there's a there's a few guys that will listen to this that will coach tour players, um, and I, I'm I'm engaged with a, a couple of guys that will play on the European tour at the minute, um, yeah. and I try and design practices based on that. Um, what can you give us an example of when you get an elite player in, you know, one of your best players? So almost like a case study. This is something that I did with an elite level player. Yeah, okay, okay, so we would be speaking to high-end players all the time in terms of the experiences they're bringing back from wherever they've been playing. Okay, okay. so if I'm, if I'm playing on this particular, this, this particular tour, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm experiencing and these are the things that are upsetting me. These are the things that I've not brought under control, that I've not, I've not stabilised. Um, so, you know, a very simple example of that is uh, a bunch of guys playing sort of Euro Pro, sometimes Challenge Tour, coming back saying, you know, there's, 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 there's loads of delays. You know, there's always delays, there's this or that, and particularly Euro Pro, because most of the Euro Pro stuff's played in uh, England. And, uh, you know, it depends how seasonal things are and various reasons. So, um, and then one of the things is this need to be able to switch back on after a delay. So we did design a simple uh, constraint into a, a session where we um, 
randomly switch them off. So we'll take a, take a hooter out and just a, randomly during, during a session, we'll sound the hooter and we'll have a 15, 20 minute delay. Okay. And uh, just, just stand about and then we'll sound the hooter and they, and they go back in again. So they, in order to learn how to um, switch back on, we switch them off so that they can practice switching back on. And uh, it's been really interesting because we typically, with a lot of the, the higher level guys, will we'll, we'll have a physical leaderboard in the practice environment. Um, and just to see how the dynamics of the activity change when we restart an activity, you know, somebody who was maybe leading um, and then starts to fall away. And it's just putting affordances into the, the practice environment, trying to intelligently design uh, constraints and situations where it gives them the opportunity to adapt to the, the the thing that they feel has been kind of upsetting them. So there's loads of other aspects of things. The only other thing I would say when it comes to working with, uh, with good players is to understand that um, more variability is good than less variability. That what you're not trying to do, and you know, people have this kind of misconception that the better the player you are, the less variability you have because everything is repetitive and you're some sort of machine that can produce, <laughs> you know, this kind of this kind of thing. And I would be, you know, working on that variability aspect of things. And uh, you know, can I find a situation where you can bring about some sort of stability here? Um, because that that reflects the um, the amount of variability you've got in your system, the amount of ways that you can bring it back to an orderly uh, situation. So you can even just think about the randomness of the practice. And I think you've seen sort of uh, Molinari doing some of that sort of stuff, hasn't he, with uh, Dave Aldred and whatnot, yeah. and you know bringing that kind of randomness into the to the players' practice. Um, so just around those ideas, guys, really, when it comes to working with. Working with better players, del deliberately fatiguing players. So you know, starting a starting a day um, in a sports hall, getting them getting them tired so that they can they can go out and train for two or three hours, fatigued, and understand how that's affecting their decision making and their uh, physical strategies and their movement patterns. So they've got they've been afforded the opportunity to to train when they're tired, which might um, mimic or reflect the latter stages of a tournament. Okay, because they're coming back saying, "Yeah, I'm kind of fatigued and I'm and I'm not really performing." So just um, all sorts of ideas around those kind of concepts. No, that's awesome. That's incredible. Um, last one for me, and uh, you said kind of a magic word there. Uh, you, you brought up affordances, and can can you just go into that just briefly? Um, kind of what it is, as well as why you want to bring that into a training environment. Yeah, I mean, my favourite affordance story is, again, back in the, the pro shop when somebody would uh, come into the shop and say, look, I think my two-year-old son's quite talented. Um, and you go, okay, well, what, what, what makes you think that? And they go, well, I, I gave him a, a club and a ball and the, he, he whacked it across the field. And I would always say, well, what else did you expect him to do with those things? Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, at which point there would kind of be a bit of silence. And I said, you know, if you give, him, <laughs> if you, if you give his twin brother uh, a club in an empty room and leave them in it for a while and stand back and have a look what they'll do, they'll produce a different behavioural response. They'll, they'll probably start sword fighting. Like. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's really just the affordances of playing with, the playing with the environment that's been afforded to you. Um, so the um, affordances are all sorts of affordances for action, how you're picking up that information, but also how you're exploiting it. Um, so... Uh, a very high level performer will be really attuned to the affordances of the environment and how they can exploit that. And that could be how a ball is going to react when it, when it hits the ground and how can I exploit that? Um, exploiting the um, variability in their system to produce a, um, a functional response. So an affordance is just something that is in the environment that we're uh, afforded the opportunity to to, to play with that and uh, but we do that in relation to our own intrinsic di dynamics so um you know a, a cat might afford uh, see a tree as an affordance to to climb up it whereas we we, we see it as something totally different so it has a, a a fair amount of subjectivity to it the affordance itself is objective it's 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 a it's a thing but what we do with that thing uh, relates to our um, own own action capabilities there's there's insects that can walk on water 
so the water affords them the opportunity to go walking on it. We can't do that. It's too heavy. So yeah, it's just a, it's just things in the environment that we can see, we can play with, we can exploit. And as we become more attuned to those things, um, we're able to exploit them more to our advantage. Awesome. Graham, thanks so much. So just a last question for me. I mean, I, I really hope, I, I know what, what you you and Pete do for the industry is incredible. I know your passion to to help players. Um, you know, I've worked with um, Euro Pro players, and and it's clear that this stuff helps them. It helps them deal with the chaos and the stress of playing for money for the first time, or having a chance to jump up to the Challenge Tour and you know deal with the the psychological pressures as as well as the the environment dynamics that that you're exposed to on the golf course. So I think everything that you do is fantastic. I hope that the people that listen to this at least check out your site and then consider subscribing. Um, but the final question, and we, we tend to always sign off with, with one like this, if a, a coach could read one book that you've read, what would you recommend? <laughs> Good, good question. <laughs> <laughs> and people know, I say one, and whenever I answer this, I, I give like seven. So I'm saying one, but I'll give you a little bit of leeway. You can throw a couple out there if you want. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, oh, I've, I've read several books around this, the, the, the area. Obviously, motor learning theory into practice, a constraints-led perspective is a very, very good access point. It's... Um, it's written in a very practical sense and the concepts are kind of fleshed out really, really nicely. So I'd uh, go for that. I can certainly provide some uh, links to the, the the other book. Now, I'll just try to see if I can find it. I remember it off the top of my head here. Is the Dam Constraints-Led Approach book with Keith Davids and colleagues. Uh, can't remember. I don't have it in front of me. But, um, yeah, the... the, the the motor learning theory into practice constraints led perspective would be a great kind of starting point for anybody interested in the sort of constraints aspect of things and the dynamical ecological dynamics integration of that into it. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll stick on that. Awesome. There's, 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 yeah. There's probably too many, right? Just flying around in your mind. <laughs> there's, there's loads, and I can't even. Yeah. Like, the, the, the difficult I'm having, I must admit, is the precision of the what they're actually blooming called. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see them, but the, the, the actual titles are escaping me. I, I think when I listen to this back, um, there's going to be definitely some stuff for me to to look at. I think uh, if it's okay with you, we might try and get Gordon Morrison on the for a podcast. I'm. I'm very interested in focal dystonias, and I've actually been fortunate enough to spend some time with uh, Dr. Fran Pirizzolo, who taught me the three ways that you can get over a focal dystonia. So I would love to compare uh, Gordon's work with that. So I'll probably message you after the show and uh, hopefully get his details and, and reach out to him. Um, Definitely. But Graham, thanks, thanks so much. much. Best, Best of luck, luck with... Uh, Golf Attack, I, I, I'm very passionate about this subject and I, I wish you guys all the success. I think what you do is fantastic. Thanks, thanks Ian. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks, Eric. Yep, thanks, Graham. So make sure you guys check it out. Golf O Tech stands for On the Edge of Chaos. And then I pulled this. You actually have this tweet pinned on your page. It's a cool quote. I just want to finish with that. The edge of chaos is where new ideas and innovative people nibble away at the edge of the status quo and where the most entrenched thinking will eventually be overthrown. Um, I really think that's kind of a powerful quote and I really like that. So just wanted to finish with that. Perfect. Cool. So Eric, that might be the best close you've ever done. Man. I that know. Was awesome. I had that planned from the beginning. <laughs> Cool. So for anybody listening that wants to stay up to date, make sure you visit our website, gltgolf.com. You can subscribe so you get the uh, weekly update email. Um, that's going to keep you updated on all the podcasts that are being released, as well as any education that's coming out. Uh, we're on Instagram, Instagram, Game L Training, Facebook and YouTube, Game Like Training Golf. We're also on Twitter at GLT Golf. Make sure you check us out. Um, also, make sure you give Graham McDowell a follow. Graham, thanks so much. That was awesome. Looking forward to getting this podcast out there. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Take it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Speak to you later. Bye. Thanks, Graham. Bye. No bother.